The net worth of households in the United States has declined by $14 trillion. What if everything we based this on was an illusion? Maybe a delusion, if you want to call it that. The fact is that the $14 trillion never really existed. It was fake. It was built upon debt, massive amounts of debt. The housing wealth that had been created and the stock wealth didn't really exist. It was all a liquidity fake, a mirage of wealth. And I got some bad news for you. This wasn't an accident. This was the result of conscious decision making and some very bad judgment. Somebody threw us in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean without a life raft. And we're trying to determine what's the closest shore and whether there's any chance in the world to swim that far. We don't know. And that's when Paulson hit the panic button. And that's what we saw on September 18th. How did that happen? There's a lot of blame to go around. One of the things that happened was the institutionalization of many of the ideas of the 1960s affecting the future of our country in a very concrete way. Ideas have consequences. And we are seeing the consequences of the ideas of the 1960s unfold uh, in our society all around us. Two things happened in the summer of 69 that are indelibly etched in our memories. You had the moon landing on the one hand, and you had Woodstock on the other. In the late 1960s, there were two visions of America deeply in struggle. One had come out of World War II. It was successful. It led the world. It landed on the moon. It believed in science and technology. It had a sense that Americans could do almost anything. There was a positive optimism about the future that was remarkable. Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. John Kennedy had said, we are going to have a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Kennedy uh, simply willed the result, and we saw that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon in the summer of 1969, a terrific achievement for America. Within the space of a few weeks of the moon landing in 1969 was the iconic music festival at Woodstock, when something like 400,000 people gathered in the mud for several days of music. It was something greater than had ever happened before. It wasn't just an event, it was now the Woodstock generation. This self-indulgent, wealthy elite that's decided to become a bunch of modern day bohemians and rewrite all the rules of our society. In the aftermath of Woodstock, once again, the elite news media rushed in to give it cosmic significance. Time magazine said that Woodstock, quote, may well rank as one of the significant political and sociological events of the age. It is the proclamation of a new set of values. The pleasure principle has been elevated over the Puritan ethic of work. To do one's own thing is a greater duty than to be a useful citizen. Personal freedom in the midst of squalor is more liberating than social conformity with the trappings of wealth. Now that youth takes abundance for granted, it can afford to reject materialism. The children of plenty have voiced an intention to live by a different ethical standard than their parents accepted. of a century ago, Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation ravaged by depression. Our crisis today is in reverse. The 1960s saw the rise of youth culture. America had become so wealthy through its free enterprise system that young people had huge disposable incomes for the first time. All of a sudden, they became the center of the universe. And you had a reversal of, of what, for centuries, was a traditional 
uh, structure of authority, which is that older people knew more than younger people, and they were revered for their wisdom. One of the awful things that happened in the 1960s was the sense, that phrase, you can't trust anybody over 30. What it meant is you can't trust any civilization beyond our present time horizon. And there was a kind of schizophrenia going on in the country. One side was operating on, I'd call, tragic premises, that there were certain limitations to the human experience. We had certain appetites we didn't want to indulge in. We worry about our public name. We worry about our daughter and her son living up to the reputation of our parents, our grandparents. We go to the cemetery. All of these were very pedestrian protocols. And they're easy to caricature, but slowly over time, they create the stuff of civilization. And there was this ongoing therapeutic movement, of, mostly among young people, that with enough education, with enough good intentions, with enough money, with enough egalitarianism, that the world as we knew it had no limitations, that we could have internal peace, we could have internal beauty, we could have eternal niceness everywhere. Wally, does the story of Pandora have any particular significance for you? Uh, you know, her curiosity and doing things she was told not to do? People really misunderstand the 1950s. Uh, they think in terms of like June Cleaver and Donna Reed, as if everybody was discriminating against women, forcing them to stay at home. But that isn't it at all. They grew up during the Great Depression. They were surrounded by death. They were surrounded by starvation. They were surrounded by bankruptcies, homelessness. Just to survive, they had to go to a soup kitchen. These same young women, their brothers, their uncles, their, uh, their fathers, were tortured on the Bataan Death March, were slaughtered like fish in a barrel on the beaches of Normandy. They were tremendously traumatized by that. And the main objective is that their kids would never have to go through anything like that again. These are mothers who had suffered their whole lives. They considered a home with a white picket fence to be the dream of a lifetime. They lavished enormous amount of love on their kids. They gave them anything they wanted, gave them all the attention they wanted. So these kids pretty much grew up getting their own way. The main characteristic of the 60s generation was moral self-righteousness, and they believed that they had spotted uh, endemic and almost ineradicable flaws in American society. So they rebelled. They, they rebelled against their parents. Girls who had been taught by their mothers to be modest decided to flaunt their sexuality. Boys who had been taught to uh, look great and uh, you know keep their hair short <laughs> began to grow grow their hair long and become hippies and so the substantive issues were superseded by a wallowing in narcissism a belief that they were the first generation in history that had a moral sense and and had the capacity to tell adults how they should lead their lives This was a time of incredible radicalism. Our institutions, the educational institutions, the cultural institutions, the moral and social institutions, churches, families, and so on, they really did undergo a kind of transformation, a revolution, if you will, transformed us inside. The destructive aspects of, of the culture of narcissism was the idea that you couldn't expect individuals to live up to traditional moral standards. And immediately, we lost our connection with the past. Uh, it was a betrayal by the elites that... I, I, I wonder if it has any precedent in history when a, a generation so turned off the light switch of the past. There was another more hardcore radical group that saw the narcissism of the hippies as a diversion. Saul Alinsky, for example, was a radical organizer who had real disdain for the hippies. They didn't have the commitment to raw power. Saul Alinsky's main motto was speak truth to power. And the presumption was that America is a fundamentally racist society, a sexist society, a society committed to inequality, society that serves only the wealthy. 
When you look at the Alinsky group, you realize this is a group that it's ultimately about achieving power. All of his techniques and so forth were based on this presumption that he was dealing with a, an essentially evil society. So Alinsky said that the elites had Machiavelli's The Prince, radicals and the people had rules for radicals. Rules for radicals teaches the dark art of destroying your political adversaries. The reality is that an entire generation of activists took this up. People that were in positions of influence in government recognized the value of the Alinsky method and used it to advance their social agenda, which ended up being very destructive for this country. And this is really the Bible uh, for activists because it provides a path to est establishing and achieving power. In a book that really is amoral, it says that there are no moral constraints. If you are dealing with an evil society, then that licenses you to extreme practices. It allows you to assault individuals on a personal level to vilify them. The only way you can change an evil society is to bankrupt that society. Two professors at Columbia University, Clowart and Piven, developed such a strategy called the crisis strategy. The essence of the Clowart Piven strategy was to sabotage and destroy the capitalist system by creating bureaucratic demands, excessive regulations, and entitlements that would lead to economic ruin, economic collapse, and bankruptcy. Once you've reached that point of bankruptcy, that society is ripe for revolutionary change. The basic presumption that America is, at its heart, an evil society. And so therefore, we are warranted, we are licensed, we are doing a good thing when we attack it, when we disrupt it. Disruption is at the center of the Clower Piven strategy. Disruption comes from the outside, but also from the inside of the system. And the inside was far more effective and far more important. By the late 1990s, the left had taken over many of the institutions of power, meaning government, media, and academe. And it was from these places and positions of power that they were able to disrupt the system and implement a strategy that was designed to ultimately undermine the capitalist system. Edmund Burke famously said, society is indeed a contract, but it's a very special one. It's a contract between the dead, the living, and those who are yet to be born. We inherit a civilization from those who went before us and gave it to us, and we are to transmit it. We are a bridge between our parents and grandparents on the one side and our children and grandchildren on the other side. We owe a duty now to the past, to who taught us the wisdom from which we draw today. And then we have a duty to the future because our decisions today affect their liberty. We have to transcend ourselves and we owe some people who gave us the freedom and the material prosperity who are now dead. The 60s were a revolution that took out our sense of responsibility for the past and our sense of responsibility to the future. And, and that's why the 60s remain so important and so devastating. When we look at history, we, we see it naturally divides itself into eras or moods. We call them turnings, which are roughly a generation long. So there's a natural correspondence between these turnings. seasons. Every turning is necessary. We discovered a recurring pattern and implicit in that pattern of generational recurrence, the idea of a rhythm, a pattern, a sequence of events that comes around again. Nature likes cycles. Cities are founded, cities collapse, uh, states rise, states fall. Uh, families can prosper, families can wither all follow certain repeating cyclical patterns. We end up inventing new cycles. We have, so we have the financial market cycle, we have traffic cycles, we have all kinds of modern high-tech cycles which we simply create. There are four turnings. 
each one roughly 20 years or so long, so an entire four turnings or a saculum lasts about 80 to, to 100 years. of turnings that are launched by a so-called crisis war. It's a time when there's a lot of genocide, a lot of killing, a lot of starvation, usually a lot of disease. It's the worst times in history. And once one of those is over, everybody, both the victors and the losers, make a vow that, they, that was so horrible, it should never be allowed to happen again. And that's really the key to understanding what happens next. The first turning is the high, like the 50s. Uh, that comes after the crisis. It's a period of consolidation. It's a period of stable families and stable family structures. Lots of kids are born, lots of infrastructure is built, but emotional life becomes more or less dead and begins to die out. Baby boomers have no memory of World War II. Their childhood was the American high. Next comes the awakening. The perfect little children of the high, like the boom generation, become young adults, they came of age during that period of rapid social and cultural change when we changed everything about how we felt, how we thought, how we talked, how we dressed. We changed America's feelings about itself, our moral agenda. Suddenly, uh, their emotions break out and all hell breaks loose. This became a, a generation of, of great passion, of youth anger that marked a rise in, in every age in drug use, teen pregnancy, crime, risk-taking, suicide. Then comes the unraveling. In the awakening, the eternal truths, the verities that are built up in the high, the values, are questioned. That process accelerates during the unraveling, and restraints are broken down in personal life, in economic life, in political life. Unravelings in America have certain common characteristics. They tend to be eras of a lot of economic uh, speculation and uh, more and more stronger boom and bust cycles. For example, line that up with the 1920s or go back to the 1850s in America, go back to the 1760s. Consider in the 1990s a decade of cynicism and bad manners and public authority seemed to be pretty weak. You notice repeatedly recurring again these eras that, that feel very similar. Now, history teaches that usually third turnings finally issue into a fourth turning. Well, the fourth turning is the crisis. And history shows that if an event doesn't trigger a fourth turning, a fourth turning leader will actually encourage one to happen. Or one will simply hit us because of all the, the deferred public decisions that weren't made during the recent third turning. This comes to a head in the fourth turning. These fourth turnings become new founding moments of our nation's history. Obviously, one fourth turning was the period of the American Revolution. Another fourth turning was the Civil War era in which we redefined who we were as a nation. In World War II and the New Deal, think of everything that changed in that era. We reestablished mankind's relationship with technology, government's relationship with the economy, America's relationship with the world. Chesterton said that when men stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They believe anything. The intense focus on the self led to a sense that the self is really God. It was all about me. It was me. Uh, I'm the most important person in the universe, and I'm going to satisfy my desires. And you come out with this insipid ethic of self-fulfillment. we got to have all the things that will make us feel good about ourselves, and we can give up all those virtues. That, I think, has been a prescription for disaster. 
they had forgotten all those work ethic virtues, not just the work, but the virtues that go along with it. A third turning we call an unraveling. In an unraveling, institutions are weak and discredited. People became uh, too self-centered, too convinced that whatever they wanted must be the best thing, not only for them, but for everyone else. Now, how does this get us to the meltdown that we're in right now? Go back to the 1980s and the 1990s, you had this real money culture that developed, this casino capitalism, and people slowly figured out how to game the system, where the house wins the money when it's a winner, but when it's a loser, it becomes someone else's problem. We had what was, what was called conspicuous consumption. The thing about the money culture is you measure all things by money. Their salary was the most important thing about them. An awful lot of people started measuring themselves, measuring their worth by what they could buy, by what they had. A lot of people have been puzzled over the question of how can somebody who was a hippie in the 60s become a yuppie in the 70s and 80s and end up as a member of high society in the 90s and 2000s. Said, how can the guy that had no socks, sandals, dirty jeans, pledge himself to eternal revolution in a mere 15 years, become a yuppie that has wraparound sunglasses that cost $300, metrosexual, a jaguar, and then he ends up in his 60s as someone that goes to the club. How did that all happen? Cultures change. They change because elites come up with ideas that are very powerful and then filter down into the culture through a variety of transmissions. They come through the newspapers. They come through the mainstream pulpits. They come through the universities and then down into the grammar schools. They come through the TV. They come through the movies. They come through the popular music, even. It's the most spoiled, self-centered, uh, process that we've seen in, in any 30 or 40 year period in American history. One of the biggest problems that has put us in the situation we're in now created the financial Armageddon, an unraveling of the U.S. and a change in America's role in the world is this very, very close and sensuous linkage between the moneyed interests, the Wall Street interests, and, and people in Washington. of attacks on that credit made by those few individuals and organizations which seek to dictate to the administration and to the Congress how to run the national treasury and how to let the needy starve. After the Great Depression, there was a narrative that was established about what went wrong and how it got solved. Well, it's all wrong, it turns out. In the 1930s, the government was all the time trying to help people, big plans, and the irony was the forgotten man was the little guy. They were hurting the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur was afraid. Even the Roosevelts knew it. FDR's spending didn't really help the American economy very much. The facts are all different. Then, 37, 38, big setback, the depression within the depression, unemployment goes to 15%, maybe higher, 20%. It seems like we're never going to get out of this. Here we are, eight years in, it's worse than it was in 29. And the duration of the unemployment made the Great Depression, the Great Depression in our memory. Who is it that leads recoveries, the person who makes the recovery happen? It's the private sector, it's the little guy. The man who pays, the man who prays, the man who is not thought of, the forgotten man. Now the problem with getting the narrative wrong is that you actually can't create public policies that solve the problem as a result of that. The conventional narrative is that the economic crisis, the financial crisis exists because we have massive deregulation of the financial market. 
The narrative is this. September 18th was when we all became really aware that markets were failing around us. They were failing like crazy. Uh, the next thing that we understood is that when markets fail, that means that capitalism has failed. Well, that narrative is wrong, just as the Great Depression narrative was wrong. Reality is we had a marriage of big government and big business. Deregulation is not the problem. We've had a high concentrations of power on Wall Street and in government, which has permitted people to abuse markets. Reality is the chief beneficiaries were the big Wall Street investment firms who had taken these risky speculative investments and lost and now wanted help from Washington. It was a perfect example of capitalism working the way it's not supposed to work. People taking enormous risk and nothing behind them except an implicit taxpayer guarantee. And the reality is we have privatized profits where Wall Street executives can take in tens of millions of dollars because of risky investments. When their mistakes became obvious and the losses piled up, they ran to the federal government for help, and all of us, even though we had nothing to do with it, bailed them out. It's really important to understand how incestuous the political system got to be in both parties. Both parties demand uh, the, the socialization, if you will, the nationalization of risk uh, and the privatization of profit. Starting really in the period after the Reagan presidency, there really became one political party in the United States, the incumbents. And they relied on the major financial institutions of Wall Street to fund their political campaigns and let them control the agenda. And the result has been, under Bush and Clinton and Bush, a series of giveaways to the corporations that are absolutely horrific. The Clinton administration formed this partnership, as it were, with Wall Street because Bill Clinton was told by Robert Rubin that the American financial system was so tied in with the global financial system that that is what mattered more than anything. And the result was a kind of corporatism, a kind of alliance between the Democratic Party and the Wall Street investors, the bond market, the hedge fund. This marriage of convenience created these enormously terrible consequences of leading to high risk and irresponsible behavior. And basically made the Democratic Party do the bidding that had traditionally been done by the Republican Party. So here you have the Clinton administration, which was supporting and encouraging Wall Street behavior, subsidizing, as it were, when they were taking terrible risks. And here you had Wall Street, which had in the past been reliably Republican, suddenly transformed into a Democratic stronghold. So the Democratic Party was now the party of Davos. This is the party of global elites, of billionaires, of financiers, who believe that we need to transform American society, fit it into this global uh, economic system. Pure capitalism is about loss and profit. What we have today is a hybrid. We have a capitalism that essentially allows for the privatization of profit. Privatization of profit means that when things go well, I get to accumulate the profits. The profits go to me. I get to keep the home in the Hamptons. I get to keep the private jet. I get to keep the bonuses. I get to keep the overseas bank account. If things go bad, if I take risks that are dangerous, and my investment goes south, you, the middle class, are going to pick it up. This is the perfect arrangement for the party of Davos and for international financiers because they have nothing to lose. There's no downside. It's all upside. And the loser in all of this is the working man and woman, the middle class of this country. Uh, the middle class, I believe, to be the foundation of this country. Above all, civic spirit, devotion to common purpose, respect for institutions, respect for laws, that's what unravels the most. When you think of bailouts, most people seem to think of helping Chrysler or giving money to Citigroup, but really, that's a small aspect of bailouts. Alan Greenspan, basically a free market apostle, bailed out the banking system. There were four big bailouts. The first one was in Mexico in 1994. A couple of years later came Russia, then came the Asian financial crisis, and finally Brazil and Argentina. In each and every case, major investment houses on Wall Street made wildly speculative investments. And in each and every instance, those investments went south. The Clinton administration stepped in and not only bailed them out with taxpayer money, but actually ensured that these investment houses walked away with healthy profits. 
after the first bailout in Mexico in 1994, it was very clear to these large investment houses that they will be bailed out. I'm talking about you, the taxpayer, being on the hook for it. This was a huge break with American tradition. If you were a bank and you made risky loans uh, to overseas governments, you were expected to bear the brunt of those risks. The situation that emerged in the Clinton years was that concerns about moral hazard were basically tossed out of the window. Moral hazard is the concept that society or institutions will allow you to do bad stuff and take a lot of risks, and they're gonna support you doing it. The idea is, is that if you create a situation where there is no repercussion for failure, there is a moral hazard. It's one of the great euphemisms of all time. I, I would simply call it, it's, it's uh, a giant friggin' lie. The best way to deter risky behavior is to allow people to bear the consequences of what they do. If you go to business school, by the way, it's like at Harvard, it takes like, you know, a year and a half, maybe two years. Moral hazard, that class, if you fall asleep between two and three o'clock in the first or second week of your, you miss the whole thing. The other stuff is all about how do you make it stick and rich? There were other voices in Congress who said there's something wrong with bailing out the large investment houses when we're expecting the American people, heck, even people on welfare, to behave in a responsible fashion. And yet Wall Street, with all of its irresponsible behavior, was being given billions of dollars in taxpayer money. We've done a number of really stupid things that led to this giant pool of bailouts. This process where you get a crisis, you get a problem, Alan Greenspan organizes the Federal Reserve to come up with a solution. There's a lot of criticism of Alan Greenspan for his role, and some people have coined the phrase the Greenspan put. Let me connect the dots for you. You know, the goal of the put was to protect the traders and speculators on Wall Street. Every time there was a dip in the market, he would lower rates and they would be rescued and the market would go back up, causing this giant spiral of inflation. So when you're filling up your gas tank and it costs you over $4 a gallon, you're essentially subsidizing the speculators on Wall Street because they know Easy Al's got their back. The whole idea behind the put was to help Wall Street and the people who paid for that was Main Street. As we loaded on more and more debt and institutions got bigger and bigger and bigger, we got to this idea that there were some things in some entities were too big to fail. There was this idea of systemic system-wide risk that if one thing failed, all the other things related to it would fail as well. Greenspan came in and opened the floodgates for money. The Greenspan put grew larger and larger. Between 2002 and 2005, the Fed was way too loose. And their excess money creation created a bubble, created a commodity bubble, created an energy bubble. This then spurred the greatest bubble in the history of mankind the housing bubble that grew through 2006. They felt like they could take ever higher and higher risk because ultimately the Federal Reserve or Uncle Sam or both would step in. You know that concept, Goldilocks economy, not too hot, not too cold? But we're gonna legislate soft landings because 20 people in a conference room are smarter than, than the actual free market. Now, since most of these guys all went to Princeton, Harvard, MIT, these guys really felt that they were smart. They knew they were the smartest human beings in the room. Then a strange thing happened in 1995. If you look at the graph of the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average, there's actually a sharp corner where the, where the graph goes up, but that was the beginning of the dot-com bubble. Why did that happen in 1995? Why didn't it happen in 1985? Why didn't it happen in 2005? Why did it happen at all? The Depression-era generation uh, was retiring. This is a generation that understood uh, the dangers of financial risk. They had grown up in the economic deprivation of the Great Depression. The baby boomers that took over only knew the upside. They only knew about prosperity. So they took over Wall Street. They had the ambition. They had the hunger for profit. And they also realized something else. They realized that up to this point, the investment houses had been partnerships. You know, all the banks that blew themselves up, they were all publicly traded. 
as Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers and Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, they used to be partnerships, uh, and now they became publicly traded. When you were a partner at a Wall Street firm, you were a partner. Now that meant joint and several liability. You have complete and total liability for anything that happens. If one of your partners really screws up badly and loses billions of dollars, when you're sued, they go after the partner's assets. And that includes not just their stocks and their bonds and their bank accounts, but their houses and their cars and their boats and their Rolexes. There is no shield. Now, let me tell you, you know, other than, you know, telling your wife that, uh, you know, you've had an affair, I can't think of a more uncomfortable situation than going to the partners and saying, oh, by the way, boys, I lost you 50 or 100 million dollars, which each one of these guys are going to have to write a check out of the checking account. Not only would you be out on your ass, you'd be out of the business because you took a stupid, insane risk and you did it with other people's money who were sitting around the desk. The old guys in the basement with the green visors, looking at the numbers, making sure that, hey, we're not going to take too much risk because I'm not going to lose my house. Everything was handled in a very fiscally prudent, very conservative basis. That's why when you look in the publicly traded companies, there is no liability on the people who made the decision. So you could wipe out the company, you could send it to zero, but these guys who paid themselves tens of millions of dollars, their houses are safe, their boats are safe, their cars are safe, their wealth is safe, it falls on the shareholders and the taxpayers. That explains it, and that's why this wasn't an accident. And it's a generation that allowed excess, individual excess, and you'd have to say greed, uh, to run rampant throughout our institutions, particularly at the highest levels of our institutions, as they reach the age of the CEO, of the top manager. And they have led us, late in the third turning, to a very dangerous situation. You didn't hear on most uh, media was this whole idea of the Bear Stearns exemption. In 2004, all the big investment bank CEOs, led by a guy named Hank Paulson, who at the time was CEO of Goldman Sachs, goes to the SEC and says, you know, this 12 to 1 rule, it's a little onerous. Every now and then we go over a little bit. We want a little leeway. We want a little room to, to expand that. And the SEC essentially granted what they called the Bear Stearns exemption. It was for Bear Stearns and anyone bigger than that. Uh, and that ends up being Bear Stearns, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, Lehman Brothers, and Goldman Sachs. Those five banks are granted this exemption and allows them essentially unlimited leverage, even though they said they weren't going to take advantage of that. We just need a smidge more leverage. Because we were 10 to 1. We're thinking more like <coughs> 40 to 1, 40, 50 to 1. But listen, um, everything will be fine because guess what? We have a risk management system. But what a surprise. They promptly leverage up 25, 30, even as much as 40 to 1 after they're given this exemption. Here's reality. At 40 to 50 to 1 leverage, you're not an investment bank anymore. You are a hedge fund. And not just any hedge fund. You are a rock and roll, take no prisoners, make huge amount of money, huge amount of bonuses, hedge fund. When you're leveraged up 40 to 1, there's a little trouble. There's no room for error. You lose 5% up 40 to 1, and you're completely wiped out. There's just no room for error. All five banks are granted that exemption. And here's the fascinating thing. And then the, the casino really begins to swing, because they go 25, 35, even 40 to 1. Bad things happen. It's not a coincidence that a few short years later, all five banks are no longer there. They don't exist, or at least don't exist as they did back then. You had enormous bonuses paid to the senior executives at these banks and then when the things got really ugly when the market collapsed when the credit crisis hit us when these banks ran into an enormous amount of trouble they went running to uncle sam their holdings that are all you know laden with toxic assets and bad investments and a lot of subprime stuff and yet they walked away with these giant bonuses it's a perverse form of socialism for the wealthy but capitalism for everybody else as I look at the, the great span of American economic and political history, I don't think there's been any other period where the financial and political elite together have so let down the ordinary working man and woman. There is a group of elites 
trying to simply say there won't be a consequence to bad decisions, bad choices, uh, whether political or economic. 30 million Americans are without work, and millions of people have lost their homes, while our elites have been saved, the consequences mitigated, and their security assured, while millions of people have lost theirs. No one is bothering to keep investing in institutions and is doing what necessary to sustain the precedence and sustain the restraint and harvest the, the feed corn and, and resave it and reinvest it in a way which will keep these institutions going for the next generation. That happens through a catastrophe and we're now in that catastrophe. is critical to the mess that we are in. From after the Civil War to the 1960s, America was the world's foundry. We won World War II and World War I essentially by outproducing the Germans and the Japanese. Over the last 30 or 40 years, we've essentially deindustrialized America through a series of trade agreements. We've lost just about six million manufacturing jobs since 2000. We've lost six and a half million jobs since December, December of 2007 and the onset of the recession. In the past, we would lose some jobs during recessions. We could get some of them back during booms. We've never had the kind of deindustrialization we've had over the last 10 years in American history. And that's simply been because your political leaders or looking out for the bankers, the Hollywood producers, and the high-tech community. Where is the concern about the more than 30 million Americans who've lost their jobs or who cannot find full-time jobs to work? Americans consume about 5% more than they produce, essentially by importing and borrowing from the rest of the world. It's why we had the big credit bubble. We now owe foreigners to pay for those goods about $7 trillion. At its low point, the stock market was only worth about 8 or $9 trillion. The people who have traditionally represented the American workers, our congressmen, uh, our senators, well, uh, they're more interested in representing vested interest, Wall Street, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the Business Roundtable, more than $3 billion a year being spent on lobbying, 435 congressmen, 100 senators, and one president. Unless we make things in America, we'll import more than we export to an enormous degree, have to borrow from the rest of the world, and eventually go bankrupt. Over and over again, we have signed bad deals, first with Japan and now with China, where they export so much more to us than they import. If one wanted to be a free trader, you could not be because the Chinese have barriers to trade. It's true throughout the entire world. Free trade doesn't truly exist, despite the efforts of the political class and both parties to try to create that illusion. China maintains an undervalued currency to keep its products artificially cheap in the United States. From 2004 to 2008, the trade deficit averaged over $700 billion a year. We now owe the rest of the world $7 trillion. That's an enormous debt. The next time around, we'll owe foreigners enough money that they could simply buy up all the stock of all the publicly traded companies in America. They could buy out America. There are less than 100 million manufacturing and mining jobs in the industrialized West. China has that many underemployed people on its farms. It could simply move those folks to the cities pay them 20 cents an hour and replace all of our jobs. How can we possibly prosper in an environment where in turn they do not buy something from us?
this policy that led to the subprime crisis and so forth came out of the fact that the civil rights movement had claimed that blacks were being redlined. Banks then didn't want to lend money to them. Here is another source of black victimization. Here's another place where this fundamentally racist society is keeping blacks down. Since the mid-60s, white Americans have been in a position where they constantly have to prove that they are not racist. It is that phenomenon of white guilt is what pressures people in the government to say things like, everybody has a right to a house. And unfortunately, capitalism doesn't work that way. In 1977, a group of activists convinced Congress to pass something called the Community Reinvestment Act. What this law did was, it gave these activist groups a veto power over banks. The foot soldiers in expanding the Community Reinvestment Act really goes to the activists like ACORN that were committed to having a transformative effect on American society. These activists would go to banks, protest at these banks, and demand that banks loosen their lending standards. And some of the uh, changes in lending standards were incredible. Uh, there were uh, demands that income should not be determined anymore simply by holding a steady job, but that you should be able to use unemployment benefits or welfare payments as proof of income. There was even a claim that banks should allow individuals that have more than one social security number who might be illegal immigrants or individuals who have spotty records in terms of employment uh, to take out loans and mortgages. It encouraged more dependency on government and less independence, less personal responsibility. And what you end up doing is getting exactly the opposite effect of what you want. Saul Alinsky believed that lying could actually be a very effective tool for advancing your cause. In fact, he applauded activists who use lying effectively. You end up where applicants lie on their applications, mortgage lenders lie when they pass that to the underwriters, and then these mortgages are sold as mortgage-backed securities on Wall Street, where oftentimes the credit scores of the individuals involved were lied about as well. So it's a chain of lie after lie after lie, which eventually undermines even the most effective system. In fact, activist groups such as ACORN actually encouraged people to lie on their applications in order to obtain mortgages. This has a very real and profound effect on the economic crisis that we face today. When Bill Clinton became president, he made turbocharging the Community Reinvestment Act one of his priorities. He got the Justice Department to go after mortgage lenders to say that if these lenders were not making proportionate loans, they could be accused of racism. So this had the effect of corroding lending standards. This is what created the explosion of subprime lending during the Clinton years and the uh, Bush administration years. It was all like this Ponzi scheme. We have this program, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which are buying and insuring mortgages. People believe the government stands behind their bonds. We need more of their resources to go to help low-income people and lower-middle-income people buy a house and live the American dream. So Fannie Mae went to the mortgage brokers around the country and said, you just make these loans. Don't ask for money down. Don't worry too much about their credit. We'll buy the loans from you. And it's our money that's going to be at risk, not your money, and you go out and make new loans. So they did, and boy, they did it with a vengeance. And then you had pizza delivery boys becoming uh, mortgage brokers and luring people into these ridiculous loans. You had senior citizens living on a pension, buying $600,000 houses with nothing down. This was spurred by the investment banks on Wall Street trying to generate fees so that they could have these ungodly compensation packages. In 1857, you had the railway shares. In 1929, you had uh, the stock market shares and also you had foreign bonds. Today, in the 2000s, it was done with uh, mortgage-backed securities and uh, credit default swaps. And they said, okay, why don't you re-insure re the mortgage? Give us an insurance policy on top of AIG called a credit default swap. And with that, I can make $10 billion of loans. Rather than telling them how to get social capital, we're going to come up with another gimmick, and it's going to be the people on the Wall Street who come out ahead, filthy rich. And the people that this policy was designed to help are without homes, credit ruined, homes foreclosed on, bankruptcies. $4.5 trillion has been committed by banks to the Community Reinvestment Act since 1977. But roughly 4.2 trillion of that has come in the last 10 years. 
This has fundamentally undermined the financial banking system in the United States. It means we're talking about an economic meltdown of $800 billion in terms of money that's washed away, that's defaulted on in the name of this grand scheme in social engineering. The black middle class, the Hispanic middle class, have been the biggest victims of this financial crisis. There's no doubt about that. We're not just talking about numbers. We're talking about people that are being yanked out of their homes. Now they have terrible credit because they've lost their home and now their financial future is in peril. So this is the devastation of a community and a devastation of individuals that have been swept up by the tsunami of financial foreclosures. Even the social fabric uh, can tend to unravel during an unraveling. But uh, essentially what you see is a series of problems getting worse and worse. You see solutions being increasingly delayed, and it's only when they become really catastrophic that uh, anybody is ready to do something about them. Fourth turnings always come as a surprise. Fourth turning itself happens with what we call a trigger. This is the trigger that lets loose a chain of events which pushes society in a new mood in a fundamentally different direction. facing something that was unique in all of human history. It was one of the darkest days in this country. The unthinkable became thinkable. But suddenly it was all interconnected. Just one calamitous decision after another. The entire global financial system would melt down. It was right there in the crosshairs. How could so many authorities not have been able to predict this? Those were very grim, grim, dark days. When the economic leadership on the 18th of September moved to Capitol Hill to tell the legislators that they desperately needed uh, money and lots of money, great liquidity to, uh, to forestall the onset of a depression. Ben Bernanke and Henry Paulson went up to Capitol Hill and told the leaders that we were seeing a financial meltdown, that Congress had to pass a $700 billion three-page bill giving the Treasury Secretary authority to disperse monies to financial institutions. Otherwise, credit would coagulate, that basically loans and currency would stop circulating. In this crisis, the one thing that everybody who had any sense knew is we had to do something. I mean, that's always the case with a crisis. If it's a crisis, throw money at it as fast as you can and hope it goes away. This, in many ways, was the philosophical basis of the Wall Street bailout. The politicians, the bureaucrats, the experts in Washington were panicking. Those who should have been leading instead were sucking on their thumbs in dark corners. People were sticking their dollars inside of mattresses. That's when you know you've got a crisis. In fact, there was a cancer in the system all along, and it was because of poor government policy. They made bets on bets. They made bets on the bets of the bets that they previously made, and they did it with a kind of blithe disregard of consequences. It was because of social engineering that was shot through the entire economic system. Well, this thing came due, and they act as if they're victims, and they need some sort of a bailout. They were deadbeats, just like the people who walked away from their mortgages. We've lived through a period of bad decision-making by leaders of American finance and business on a scale never before seen in any business culture ever. A 20-year cycle of lying to ourselves about reality, of kidding ourselves about bureaucrats being able to control a free market. Squander, squander wealth at a rate unimaginable at any period in our history, and I'm talking about in any century and any decade. It is a decade of absolute shame. We should never underestimate the power of human self-delusion. Let's be clear about this. The political class, right and left, Republican and Democrat, saw this crisis coming. There were warnings from the Bush administration, warnings from the regulators as early as 2003. And the old bulls, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, doesn't matter who was in control, they were unanimous on one thing, nothing can change. And nothing did change. 
the time had come to begin to figure out how to reorganize and how to go through a very difficult and very painful process of getting rid of bad debt, getting rid of companies that were bankrupt, uh, getting rid of management that had failed. And in the end, the Goldman Sachs Secretary of the Treasury and the Princeton intellectual head of the Federal Reserve couldn't bring themselves to that level of change. They decided to find who to pin the blame on rather than accept it themselves, the people who caused it, the political class. There is a group of elites trying to simply say there won't be a consequence to bad decisions, bad choices, whether political or economic. Well, I think September 18th was a moment in history when the establishment confronted reality and flinched. A fourth turning revolves around a crisis of trust. Trust is what keeps institutions together. The only reason institutions have legitimacy and function is because we all trust them. Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson, Federal Reserve uh, Chairman Ben Bernanke were overstating the issues and the events uh, to a degree that I think there's nothing less than marked hyperbole, uh, perhaps unmatched since the Great Depression. And in fact, they intervened largely to prop up their friends in Wall Street, largely at the expense of virtually everybody else. I'm a populist. I don't think that uh, saving AIG uh, or Goldman Sachs or uh, Bear Stearns or Lehman Brothers uh, warranted the highest priority. What does warrant the highest priority is bringing back moral hazard to understanding that without consequence, we're a nation refusing to grow up. Uh, we're acting irresponsibly. One element of a fourth turning is when leaders are no longer believed, uh, when leaders continually say things will, won't happen or guaranteed they won't happen, and they do. And so we took an enormous step down the road towards government control of our economy. Uh, we wasted an immense amount of money, uh, and we propped up institutions that would have been better off to have been replaced or to have emerged in dramatically different form after bankruptcy. There was never a thought that the government would step in with $800 billion of money to be thrown around anywhere to put your finger in the dike anywhere. Or that the, the, the Bush administration's treasury head would call in the head of the nine largest banks and essentially say, as of today, I'm your partner, sign on the dotted line. That's the kind of stuff that happens in banana republics with a gun on the table. In America, you do it with a pen instead of a gun. There's always been an old saying that capitalism without bankruptcy is like religion without hell. The people in Washington decided, I guess what, we're all going to be Unitarians or something, and there's no more downside to capitalism. Anybody who makes a mistake gets bailed out. Anybody who has losses, the taxpayers are responsible for somehow filling in the hole. This is why the whole bailout culture is so dangerous for America's long-term vitality. When a few greedy, stupid, silly people indulged the system and didn't bring the moral requisites to it, it's sort of like running a, an engine without oil, and they took the oil from the engine, the engine blew up. It was a cultural crisis, because it is a culture that undergirds both the political, financial, and civic institutions within a country. That's an ethical problem. That's not a problem of capitalism. That's a problem of character. For a culture to believe that it can be a consumer-based society that doesn't produce, that can shift wealth around, that isn't commonly grounded in a, in a firm wall fiber, this is how these things occur. The only thing too important to fail in the United States was the American people and that the institutions, both political and financial, were accountable to them. The U.S. is a turnaround right now. We can invest in turnarounds. They can be difficult. But we've got a lot of wonderful assets here. We have a country that people want to live in. Uh, the U.S. government's incredibly solvent. You know, people look at, get concerned about an extra trillion dollars or, or two of debt, and that's a very big number. But you have to remember that the, the government owns, you know, 35% of every corporation because they, they have taxing power. The government owns 40% of every wealthy individual's earning power. Uh, that is a big off-balance sheet asset. The government owns 40% of every wealthy individual's earning power. The government owns 40% of every wealthy individual's earning power. The government owns 40% of every wealthy individual's earning power. The question often arises as to whether the federal government is bankrupt. I suppose in some technical, uh, literal sense, uh, it already is.
country's been around for over 200 years, and in that period of time, we accumulated $5 trillion worth of debt. Stop and think about two centuries and change to get to $5 trillion. Since then, we've doubled it. The unfunded liability of Social Security and Medicare is over $100 trillion. We have, it stands right now, a $12 trillion national debt. Over $7 trillion in external debt or trade debt. Uh, a two, almost $2 trillion federal budget deficit. In 2009, the federal government is borrowing over $1.8 trillion. That comes to more than $150 billion a month. Next year, it'll be $1.4 trillion, and we're going to continue borrowing over $100 billion a month, over a trillion dollars a year. It doesn't take a PhD in economics to think that you can run $1 trillion, $2 trillion, $5 trillion, $10 trillion of debt. These numbers are simply incomprehensible. They're so large. People have a hard time conceptualizing what a trillion is. You live to be 72 years old. You will have lived about 2 billion seconds. In order to get to a trillion, you would have to live to be over 31,500 years to be a trillion seconds old. The fiscal crunch can be dated fairly precisely. It's the year 2011. That is the year the first baby boomer turns 65 and qualifies for, for, for Medicare benefits. The iceberg under the surface, I'm talking about the liabilities in the form of promises that we have made to people, particularly younger people today, that we will be able to pay them their social security, their pensions, and their health care uh, for the rest of their lives, strongly subsidized by government, when we haven't the slightest ability to sustain and, and underwrite that funding without massive borrowing, borrowing far beyond, um, orders of magnitude beyond what we can afford. It means we would need to have somewhere in a bank, $100 trillion right this minute, earning interest. Now the problem with that is the total national wealth of the United States of the money that every single American has saved added up the value of every corporation, the value of every security, every stock, every bond. If you add all of that together, it only comes to just over $50 trillion. So we have promised twice the wealth of the entire United States to the elderly that will have to be paid one way or another. It'll have to be paid either by raising taxes or by truly massive spending cuts. How do you cure a hangover? Well, you know, you have another beer, right? So now what's intriguing here is that we had the greatest debt explosion bubble in the history of humanity. And what is the cure? To borrow the most money the United States has ever borrowed in the history of humanity. Now, if that sounds a little illogical to you, you know, for the guys in rehab, it makes a lot of sense. The way you cure a hangover is pop another beer and, you know, have a shot of whiskey. But those guys usually don't get out of rehab. That's the problem. In the summer of 2009, we had these tea parties, right? These were hundreds of thousands of people so angry, so upset about the health care plan, but really it wasn't just that. It was about spending out of control. And this idea that we're going to go borrow $9 trillion, run deficits of a trillion dollars for the next eight to nine to ten years, um, is slowly, slowly uh, being punctured, this idea. Well, fast forward, my friends, when we add another $9 trillion onto the $12 trillion we've already borrowed, we're going to have revolution. And frankly, that's what it's going to take because of all the irresponsibility. Let's talk about this bizarre concept that's called the new era of responsibility, renewing America's promise. This is a budget that has $9 trillion of deficit spending. we got to go out and borrow that money. The interest we already pay today, $400 billion of interest, and that's at the historically low interest rates. Let's go to now $20 trillion or $21 trillion of borrowed money. And let's use a 5% interest rate, which would be a historical number. We would be paying more than a trillion dollars, ladies and gentlemen, a trillion dollars in interest. We wouldn't be paying down the debt. We would just simply be like the consumer at home who only pays a minimum on their credit card. That's what we're talking about, and that begins uh, what I'm calling the financial death spiral. One way or another, someone has to buy all that paper. If no one's there to buy it, 
then either we have to go to the Chinese and ask them to buy it, or the Federal Reserve has to print money. The money supply has tripled since October of 2008. Tripled. They have printed more money than has ever been printed in the entire 225-year history of the United States put together. It's gone from 800 billion to over 2.5 trillion dollars. You ain't seen nothing yet. The real catastrophe is gonna come in about a year, a year and a half, or two years, when all of this money that the Fed has been printing comes out of hiding all at once and causes explosive inflation. Hyperinflation, it's what destroyed the Weimar Republic and the rest of Europe in the 1920s and 1930s and brought us to the dark valley of the rise of fascism. 120 billion marks for a piece of herring. 300 billion marks for a half pound of apples. 1 billion marks for a loaf of bread. Workers' wages can't keep up with the daily rise in prices. 49,000 marks to the dollar. Then 100,000, 200 million marks to the dollar, 4 trillion. The Mint works round the clock to print and overprint paper money. I can't escape the feeling that what I lived through as a young teen and in my 20s, young adult, and what I thought about and had seen, pictures of people in Germany carrying bushelfuls of Deutschmarks to try to buy something because they'd printed so much money money was worthless. To get a loaf of bread, uh, you needed these huge... Uh, so, uh, and out of this terrible inflation came tyranny, came a demand, somebody must do something. We need a strong person to do something. And, and I have a dreadful feeling that's where we're coming to. What's developed in America today is really the worst of both worlds. We have big government and we have big finance and big business that have merged and have become joined at the hip. And as much as either one wants to complain about the other, they both have the same common agenda. Big business doesn't believe in capitalism. They believe in protecting their own institutional investments and their own institutional bottom lines. And big government doesn't dislike big business. They love big business because big business can serve their own social agenda and their own ends. So we have a system today where elites are joined together and have the ability to transform or direct American society to almost any direction that they want to take. And when you get into a crisis era, literally anything can happen. The restraints come down. These are the areas of revolutions. These are the eras of reigns of terror, such as happened in France in the 1790s, or such as happened uh, in the Soviet Union uh, during the Russian Revolution and the Civil War. This is probably at the core of the biggest crisis that we will have to overcome in this coming fourth turning. There will be geopolitical dimensions to it. If the United States becomes financially unable to project its influence in the world and through military and other strengths protect its friends and allies in its own interest, then I think the consequences will be a lot more devastating than simply loss of financial clout. Because other countries will be in a position to take advantage of us, we will not be able to finance uh, the necessary uh, military response. The focus of our fourth turning, the mismatch between what we as individuals think we have been promised by government and what we are living our lives in a sense expecting to get. This mismatch will come to a head. Politically, I think we will grow weaker and others will see that and try and take advantage of that as well. So what's the solution to all this? Very simple, a four-letter word. Stop. S-T-O-P. Stop. Stop spending this kind of money. Stop over-regulating the economy. Stop taking over health care and running it out of the federal government. Stop trying to manipulate the banking systems. Obama has a view of social justice in America, which would move us to a place far different from where we are now, much more towards a European model. He's outlined very boldly, very unapologetically, very openly. Uh, what his agenda is. Changing education, changing health care, changing our energy system, or basically changing the commanding heights of the U.S. economy, and putting us on a path where the government will be far more involved in our daily life than ever before. 
and the party of incumbents will rally around the financiers and protect them. And you'll be right back with the kind of crisis that happened in Wall Street that almost destroyed this country. No one should underestimate where we are today. We have no evidence yet that we have found our way out of a period of great economic difficulty. The most you can say is that the period of decline has slowed. There's no sign at all of the kind of rebound that would enable you to say we've recovered. We may get some economic growth. It's frankly almost impossible to spend as much money as the Obama administration is spending and not get something happen. The American people are outraged even if the elites aren't. And the elites can't be outraged because they're in the fix. But the average American understands what's going on. The moral outrage that we saw at this very overt act of expropriation and generation of wealth upward to the elite from the working, hard working people, tax paying people, that sense of outrage remains. The average American is going to pay higher taxes while having lower wages and fewer jobs in order to subsidize the very wealthy who have been, in fact, ripping off the system. How do you take a structure of governance that has the political and financial elites too big to fail and the American people only big enough to keep paying? It is as if the American people now face a political and financial Frankenstein that has to be fed with their money to keep away from the door lest they be devoured. This requires some very, very tough thinking. It means if we are going to embrace the path of free enterprise that has made this country great, we're going to have to do some hard things and make some hard decisions. And we're going to have to tell some people, no, they're not going to get bailouts. You either have the courage to make the hard decisions now, or you're forced later on to live with the hard consequences. It's part of what we call maturity, being an adult, having real judgment. I feel uh, absolutely convinced that we are going to get this economy back on track. There is a lack of quality in our leadership, in every aspect, in every role, in every part of our public life. But the real crisis in leadership begins in the homes and the households uh, of this country. Until the American people understand that they have to take responsibility for their own lives, that we can no longer depend on elites uh, for their efforts of their energy being dedicated to our interests. Uh, we're going to continue with one of the most threatening crises in our country's history. The problem that we face is one of national character right now. We have traditionally thought of the American way of life as one in which we enjoy a huge amount of thriving and prosperity but furthermore, we engage in a system of free enterprise and prosperity and opportunity that we pass on to our children that means that they're going to have at least as much opportunity as we ever had. Well, what we're doing right now in response to this crisis is completely contrary to that. Our political class is telling us that what we need to do to save ourselves is to mortgage the future of our country and the future of our children. That's a change in our national character and a change in our national culture. That's a very, very extreme thing to do. The forgotten man in the 1930s was the little guy who didn't happen to be in the program from the government, the small business who didn't happen to fall into one of the favored groups of the New Deal, the little business who's struggling and waiting for the government experiment and the recession to end. The forgotten man today is our children and grandchildren because we're taking the money and we're leaving them with the debt. The grandparents are robbing the grandchildren. We're loading the debt on their shoulders and telling ourselves a little bedtime story that'll be all okay. The essence of Greek tragedy is that it's not like a traffic accident where somebody dies. In the Greek sense, tragedy is where something happens because it has to happen because of the nature of the participants, because the people involved make it happen. And they have no choice but to make it happen because that's their nature. 
That's what's happened in this case. We have these mothers who raised their kids in the 1950s, determined to make sure that their kids and grandkids would never have to suffer like they did during the Great Depression and World War II. But in overprotecting their kids, they launched something in the 1950s, uh, which is uh, a tidal wave that's now reaching our shores today in the 2000s. And they're bringing about exactly the tragedy that they had tried to avoid. Law of unintended consequences says that not only would we have to live through that pain, but we would bring that pain upon ourselves that this sense that there was no risk, there was no mountain we couldn't climb. That same generation created financial Armageddon, not just for themselves, but for their children, their children's children, and they wiped out 200 years of financial responsibility for their ancestors, all in about 20 years. A lot of what we have just seen is a kind of a real world dramatization of those ideas that became popular in the 1960s and 70s and that had a, a, a dry run then. That, I think, has been a prescription for disaster in some very concrete ways. Take, for example, the financial crisis. What we have just seen with the irresponsible lending by banks and the irresponsible leveraging by many hedge funds is a abdication of responsibility. It was irresponsible of the banks to lend to people who had no assets, no income, no job, uh, no credit history. It was irresponsible of the people who took those mortgages not to pay them, to walk away from them. It was irresponsible of a hedge fund to leverage itself 30 times and expose itself to catastrophic consequences should something bad happen and something bad did happen. We, in my generation, bear an absolute responsibility for squandering that wealth and for what we have done to future generations. My generation owes it to the moment in history in which we live and to those succeeding generations to try to right what we have absolutely failed in over the course of the past 40 years. It's a great burden. Unfortunately, we're not the ones who will carry that burden, but future generations of Americans certainly will. Thomas Paine, back in the American Revolution, said these are the times that try men's souls. And certainly Abraham Lincoln and FDR during the Civil War and the Great Depression, they had similar expressions about how we need to soldier on. We needed to continue to do the right thing. We needed to reach down within ourselves for resourcefulness, for fortitude. And these are times that will be remembered by future generations. No one should underestimate where we are today. We're either going to be a secular, socialist, European-style, government-dominated country with slow economic growth and dramatically more power in our politicians, or we're going to fundamentally shift to basic American values, the work ethic, entrepreneurship, decentralization, local government, volunteerism, all the things that have for 400 years made us so dramatically different than Europe and so much more productive than anybody else on the planet becomes a time of testing, of adversity, and it becomes a time, too, when the best qualities of every generation comes to the surface and becomes very important in steering history in a good direction. Each season has a vital function. America, usually during fourth turnings, they solve huge problems. But more importantly, fourth turnings are necessary for the evolution of civilization. There has to be a period when we get rid of what's old, particularly what's old institutionally. We make the ground fresh again for the young. The question of what that new order will be is up to us and to the younger generations, and it always will be. We have to remember that this period we're going to go through, however dark it becomes, however much it tries us and tests us, will be a time, hard as that may be to believe, that younger generations will look back to with fond memories. This was their gate of history. This was the time that they set out and began to create a new world. There have been three huge moments of choosing in American history. The Revolutionary War period up through creating our Constitution, the Civil War period, and the Great Depression and World War II. In those three periods of choosing, people had to decide what kind of country we were gonna be, where we were gonna go as a nation, what our future was all about, and what values we held. 
I think we are entering a similar period that will probably last 20 years and be an ongoing, continuous challenge. When this is over, we won't be the country we have been. The choices over the next few years are among the most profound we will have seen in all of American history. Repeatedly throughout our history, particularly toward the end, we figure that we've solved humanity's problems forever and winter is never going to come back again. The wisdom of the ancients was that that's not possible. Winter does come back. History is seasonal and winter is coming. Nobody is accounting for what they're spending. You got people and families out here in the United States that are struggling. I just paid six hundred dollars worth of utility bills in one week. I haven't got enough money to feed my.